<clears throat> Good afternoon. All that had to be said about uh, the India-US relationship has mostly been said by Harsh and by Raj. <clears throat> I'm happy to address the issue of the India-US relationship specifically in the context of the Indo-Pacific theater. For if we were to speak of the Asia-Pacific or Trans-Pacific, we would really be confining ourselves only to the Americas and East Asia and excluding India's continental and maritime contiguity. From the Indian perspective, foreign and security policy in India's neighborhood covers the entire expanse of Asia Pacific and extends to West Asia, which in the West is designated as the Middle East. <clears throat> Not so long ago, almost until the end of the 20th century, the Japanese looked upon the end of Asia Pacific in Myanmar. And since then, Prime Minister Abe has spoken of the confluence of the two nations, the Pacific and the Indian Ocean, giving wider currency to the novel coinage of the term, the Indo-Pacific, popular in Australia, with Indonesia as its center, and therefore popular there as well. India straddles and is uh, the fulcrum of the region between Suez and Shanghai, between West Asia and East Asia, and between the Mediterranean and South China Sea. So India sees itself as part and parcel of any security architecture in Asia, including the vast Indo-Pacific space. For the United States, Indo-Pacific has always been important. Uh, changes in the world in the past quarter century since the ending of the Cold War provide the larger context in which Indian and American interests intersect in shaping an Asian security order, or you might like to call it with a better term, architecture. There has been an unprecedented geo-economic shift, which we are all very familiar with, from the North and the West to the South and the East, more specifically from the North Atlantic to East Asia. This unrelenting process, driven first by Japan and followed by South Korea, China, and Southeast Asia, has since carried on with other Asian countries, including India, joining in. India's accelerating economic growth and its will to power, demonstrated by its nuclear weapon tests of 1998, which the United States did its best, best to prevent, changed the dynamic of the India-US relationship paradoxically. These factors also explain the change in the US orientation in pursuing its rebalance to Asia, supplementing the exclusive focus on East Asia to cover the wider Indo-Pacific region. <clears throat> the most spectacular change in the last 25 years really has been China's uh, achievement in lifting half a billion people out of poverty in a single generation. <clears throat> China's economic transformation has been particularly rapid between the year 2000 and 2015. In the early years of the 2000s, it surpassed Japanese GDP in terms of market exchange rates, and now rapidly it's accelerating towards tripling the Japanese output. Greater Chinese assertiveness has gone hand in hand with China's economic growth, as can be seen in the pursuit of its territorial interest, interests in recent years. China has begun to challenge the United States as the exclusive security provider in East Asia. Indeed, through its growing anti-access and anti-denial capacity, China has thrown a gauntlet to the United States. Even in the new dimensions of warfare, cyber, and space, China's progress is growing formidably. Other changes in Asia are also not so benign. West Asia and the Gulf, connected to South Asian security in significant ways, are in a greater state of turmoil than at any time since the dissolution of the Ottoman Empire a century ago. The border crossing between Syria and Iraq in northern Mesopotamia, straddling the river valleys of Tigris and Euphrates, underpinned by the 1916 Sykes-Picot Agreement, came crashing down five years ago, bulldozed in 2011 by the Daesh military commander Omar al-Shishtani, who was killed in a drone strike five months ago. The unraveling of West Asia, which started with the 2003 Iraq invasion, has accelerated since then. What are the changes in the rest of Asia that are 
that confront policy makers in India and the United States. It's tempting to embrace the notion that for over 40 years, since the end of the Vietnam War in 1975, no major wars have been fought in Asia. The pathway to Asian security or to an Asian security architecture, however, is full of potholes. Two of the biggest ones that will test Chinese and American statecraft and diplomacy are DPRK and Pakistan, the two nodes of global proliferation and terrorism. The turbulence in West Asia is echoed in North Asia and South Asia following DPRK's nuclear and miss missile tests and possible unraveling of the AFPAC region where Afghanistan's security continues to be seriously compromised by the support, sustenance and sanctuary provided by Pakistan to groups like the Haqqani Network which has taken over the management of Taliban's military machine. Other problems in Asia include strategic mistrust or misperception, underlined by uh, Joe Beckwold this morning, unresolved borders and territorial disputes, competition over energy and other natural resources, and the rise of new nationalism, which has equally affected other parts of the world. <clears throat> if you go back a decade and a half, uh, around the year 2000, the two words national interest had begun to acquire an almost pejorative connotation. The European Union was then the great exemplar of regional cooperation, integration, and open borders. The EU is currently stressed. The world is facing greater flux than the preceding decades, and as it becomes more hazardous, in these circumstances, it becomes difficult to speak of a stable Indo-Pacific theater when the wider global architecture itself is so unsettled. The benign international environment expected as a product of the end of the Cold War is nowhere to be seen. And those of you, I'm sure the majority here would have read Henry Kissinger's extraordinary book published two years ago entitled World Order, where he comes to the conclusion in the epilogue section, that the world is in a greater state of disorder today than at any point of time since the end of the Second World War seven decades ago. The challenge that India and the United States confront is how to create stability in the Indo-Pacific theater at a time when the global order itself is in a state of disrepair. <clears throat> the strategic vision document that was agreed between India and the United States when President Obama came here as uh, our guest at the Republic Day function in 2015, is generally regarded as a forthright commitment on the part of India and the US to work together on a range of security issues in the Indo-Pacific theater, including the management of the rise of China. Votaries of closer India-China ties view the vision document as undermining India's relations with China which believes that the United States is seeking to enlist India to contain the rise of China. The document refers to accelerated infrastructure connectivity between South, Southeast, and Central Asia, ensuring freedom of navigation, especially in the South China Sea, avoidance of the use or threat of force in settlement of disputes, and strengthening the East Asia summit dialogue process. Misgivings in China about the future direction of India's policy have arisen when this document is read together with a host of joint statements issued, uh, the host of India-US documents, going back not just to Mr. Modi's uh, regime, but at the t t to the time of Dr. Manmohan Singh, where uh, of late India has noted that Act East is in consonance with and provides opportunities uh, together with the US rebalance to Asia and along with other Indo-Pacific countries to strengthen regional ties, upgrade trilateral consultations, including the one between India, Japan, and the United States. And uh, the one joint statement issued in January 2015 mentioned not just upgrading of the India-US-Japan dialogue, trilogue, to the level of foreign ministers, but spoke in terms of joint projects of mutual interest among them. It also underlines the re-energizing of the India-US strategic partnership through stronger defense, security, and economic cooperation, including upgrading 
of their bilateral naval exercise, the Malabar. In fact, none of these initiatives are new, and India's policy towards China remains unaltered in its fundamentals. Given China's strategic support for the nuclear and conventional arming of Pakistan, the increasing Chinese military presence in the Indian Ocean and its littoral states, the pressure of an unsettled border with China, resulting in an adversarial relationship, India will naturally seek countervailing assurance in deepening its ties with the United States, with Japan, Australia, Vietnam, South Korea, and the ASEAN states generally, particularly Indonesia. India's contestation and cooperation with China will go hand in hand. India has never contemplated a containment or alliance strategy directed against China. Indeed, India wishes the opposite to comprehensively engage China much as the United States does. With India seeking sustained high growth and China transforming its economy to avoid the middle income trap, both will gain by preserving strategic peace and forging increased mutual dependence between them. The path towards this, however, is admittedly difficult. Western scholars believe that Asia, including the Indo-Pacific theater, either cannot easily be stabilized or will be stabilized on the basis of Chinese hegemony. Sam Huntington, basing himself perhaps on an erroneous reading of history, wrote, and I quote, the choice for Asia is between power balanced at the price of conflict or peace secured at the price of hegemony. Western societies might go for conflict and balance. History, culture, and the realities of power strongly suggest that Asia will opt for peace and hegemony. China is resuming its place as a regional hegemon, and the East is coming into its own. This was written exactly by the date 20 years ago, in 1996. Huntington startlingly assumed that in terms of political culture, Asians are markedly different from Europeans. Incidentally, this also comes through in Henry Kissinger's writings. His assumption that Asians are prone to supine behavior might have come from the ease with which European powers came and occupied much of Asia in the age of imperialism. But Japanese militarism and Chinese, Vietnamese, and Afghan resistance doesn't square up with this. If not Chinese hegemony, then the other prognostication about Asia in political science literature is the inevitability of serious conflict and war. The diversity of Asia's culture and polity, its civilizational heterogeneity, the shifting and divided allegiances that could be complicated by prejudice and misjudgment, the uneven growth across nations and sub-regions, the disproportion in the size of Asian economies, the asymmetry in comprehensive national power among its states, all are set to militate against cooperative behavior. It lacks an institution such as the Commission of Security and Cooperation in Europe, which include its diverse members and attenuate conflicts amongst them, and is composed of nation states that have not embrace the Westphalian system and are therefore doomed to repeating the mistakes of the West. According to the Princeton political scientist Arendt Friedberg, I quote again, Europe's past could be Asia's future, unquote. Will Asia then see similar conflict and carnage in the 21st century that Europe saw in the 20th? My contention is that this need not be so. To suggest that Asian states are dissimilar in most respects, as indeed are states in other parts of the world, doesn't make them especially prone to conflict. The realist contention that emerging multipolarity in Asia is likely to make the region more prone to conflict doesn't make sense when polycentrism has had a generally stabilizing effect in Europe. While Asia admittedly does have a recognized regional structure, doesn't have a recognized regional structure in contrast to Europe. It has several overlapping sub-regional, cross-regional, and regional groupings, such as ASEAN, such as uh, HICA, the Conference of Interaction and Confidence Building Measure in Asia, of which India and China are members, 
the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, the East Asia Summit, and the ADMM Plus now, which is a, uh, a further extension of it, and the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership currently under negotiation. These can manage diverse security-related issues, even if no overarching security order or architecture is invented in the short to medium term. What about the One Belt, One Road initiative? It is an emblematic and imaginative initiative, no doubt, and could have constituted an organizing basis for Asian solidarity and cohesion, but has fallen short of that expectation. It is seen as sinocentric, a way to rebalance the Chinese economy and use its surpluses of funding, labor, and materials to develop its hinterland and to invest in partner countries. All roads of both the combined initiatives, SREB, the Silk Road Economic Belt, and the 21st Century Maritime Silk Road, emerge from and end in China. It might have been better had it been designated originally as one belt and many roads. If China even now were to engage India in a serious dialogue on how to link India with the CAREX region, the Central Asia Regional Economic Cooperation, through Pakistan and Iran, through a win-win type of cooperation that the Chinese leaders espouse, India might look differently at the Belt and Road Initiative. Even so, despite our reservation, India participated in the setting up of the Asia Infrastructure and Investment Bank, which was specifically devised to promote connectivity and integration in Asia, similar to OBOR's objective, in cooperation with existing multilateral development banks. India joined 21 other countries in doing so, and India now is the second largest shareholder in the bank. On June 24, 2016, at the governing body meeting, the AIIB board approved its first four project loans, including one of highway construction in Pakistan, co-financed with the European Bank of Reconstruction and Development. India is also part of the Kunming Initiative, or the Bangladesh-China-India-Myanmar Forum for Economic Cooperation Corridor, connecting Kunming to the port city of Kolkata. Indeed, the AIIB is an example of uh, <clears throat> the United States sometimes unilaterally pursuing, as Foreign Secretary mentioned, now uh, enmesh Asian countries increasingly with each other and with the rest of the world. India was a latecomer in this direction, and the one area of discontinuity in India's foreign policy, in the neighborhood first policy, that you can see, which is very obvious, is the commitment to uh, lift our game in the neighborhood in terms of connectivity. And here again, there could be a consonance of long-term interest with the United States. The question that might be really uppermost in your minds and which we have not devoted any time to is what would be the consequence of a Trump-led insular and inward-looking United States? What does it foretell for Asia? In a word, it's too early to say. One result could be China inching closer to occupying the center stage in the global arena and becoming an even more preeminent power in Asia than it already is. The United States sought to bring China into a closer embrace strategically in order to farm out some of its global responsibilities, you can see that in Afghanistan, and divide the burden of carrying and paying for global public goods. In the process, in the pre-2002 era, India had the chagrin of finding successive U.S. presidents who had the proclivity of talking to China about the management of South Asia and how India used to protest those days. Those days, luckily, are behind us. But more recently, in 2013, when Xi Jinping came to power, at the Short Sleeve Summit in Sunny Lands in June 2013, he proposed this brilliant idea of a new type of great power relationship as a co-equal of the United States. And uh, this is something that found ready resonance 
among many in the US establishment, including people like Jim Steinberg, who wrote, who made a public advocacy in favor of this idea. This was for a variety of reasons, given up by President Obama, and later reluctantly by China, which converted it into a slightly different uh, idea, new type of relationship with the great powers in the plural, not in the singular, which incidentally in excluded India because China said relations with India were very important as a neighboring country, but neither is India considered a great or leading power by China, nor is it considered formally a nuclear weapon state. China speaks of rearranging the world order to accommodate the present existential reality in order naturally to promote a higher place for itself in the global hierarchy. It does not mean that India, which was left out of the post-war arrangements which predated India's independence, should be accepted in bodies such as the United States. Strong, sustainable, balanced and inclusive growth. President Obama's effort following his speech to insist that the TPP was not dead, didn't cut any ice with the audience of that meeting and did not evoke confidence about the future of the United States. China make one, might make one more effort to uh, establish an informal G2, but I suspect that if this were to be made for the same reasons as the first effort failed, failed this would fail too. However, there could be repercussions of many possible decouplings as a result of the unpredictable state of future US policy, something that was hinted by Foreign Secretary, but he didn't really complete his thought on it, uh, perhaps because we decided to make this an open meeting. That is what is going to determine the contours of the new alignments in Indo-Pacific and condition the action of individual states, including India. Decoupling of United States with Europe, the intra-European recoupling, the unraveling of West Asia, the questions about the future of extended deterrence, which will basically involve the US relationship with South Korea and Japan, the state of uh, future coupling between Russia and China predicated on the assumption, and I'll give you the example of the Russian thinking on Central Asia, that there would be a division of tasks between Russia and China, that there is indeed one and that would carry on into the indeterminate future, which is that China would create the geo-economic win-win cooperation and forge connectivity and build infrastructure in the area. And Russia, in return, would be allowed primacy or rather the exclusive charge of regional security. Is this going to be real? So many of these questions cannot really be answered straight away, and only the future can tell. Looking at the transition teams of both the State Department and the Defense Department in the United States, other than Michael Pillsbury, who we all know very well in the Institute because he came here and talked to us, there is not a single recognizable name. And I'm saying this, uh, and I don't know what Raj has to say on it, but Raj knows the United States better than I do. I was the Joint Secretary in charge of relations with the United States, co-terminus with the first term of the Bush presidency. I can't find a familiar name other than Pillsbury. So let me leave you with uh, a question or a tantalizing thought that the worries about the uncertainties of what is going to happen within the Beltway in the United States, the future of US administration and its policies, is far, far greater in Beijing and Islamabad and also, I dare say, at the GHQ in Rawalpindi than in New Delhi. I thank you.